Okay, uh, before we get started, thank you, Deepa. Let's, uh, let's pause for some prayer. Uh, so we're kind of packed in here this morning, which is good. It's a good, it's not even a problem, it's just good. Uh, but let's pray, can we? Because this could be a critical week for us. I talked to an agent uh, this week about a building on Washington Street in Newton. It's looking promising. I know you guys have been praying the last, uh, well, you've been praying since last July, since uh, we kind of learned that this was going to happen. But uh, since January, we've been here, and uh, the Lord's blessed. We, we're still, people are coming, and visitors, and growing, so praise God for that. But, um, you know, at some point, it's going to be hard, like, unless I build another level here, <laughs> we're packed. And so, it would be kind of nice to have a facility to be able to expand in and also give my neighbors downstairs a break. So uh, can we just spend just a couple minutes and pray? I'm going to get situated while you guys do that. But just pray whether the Lord would have us to get this place at 580 Washington. That's the address. And then I'll, I'll turn on here in a second. We can go live or record uh, for next week. So, okay, let's get to work. Just pray if you feel inclined to do that. Uh, if not, and just kind of listen to the, the low roar. And we'll get started in a second. Okay, um, let me just pray to a conclusion on that. Father, we do thank you for this space that you've provided it for us to meet in, in our home. And God, we are packed in here, but uh, trust you continue to grow. We don't want to stop and just be comfortable. We're not a country club trying to make each other soft and nice and, and easy. God, we, we know there's a lot of work to do. And so God, I pray that you would provide us a place, a tool. And in the meantime, Lord, help us to just be faithful with what we have. Uh, we love you and are grateful for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, uh, make yourself at home, literally. You can do that. There's coffee and something there. I just ran by it, maybe uh, some pastries. Uh, we're going to be in a different passage this morning. So Deepak read sort of a classic passage on the end of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and then his resurrection, right? The sort of implied there. And so we're going to look at some scripture on this. But what I want to talk about this morning 
uh, yesterday, we went out and did some evangelism in the area, and we targeted, just in faith, the area sort of around what, what I'm calling the new building. Now, now, I may eat those words. We may not get this place, but uh, just trusting the Lord for this, this area up on Washington Street, about a mile from here. And we were met with a lot of different things, encouragement, met some believers, also met some folks that have no bearing whatsoever in Scripture, uh, don't know the Bible, and that's okay. For, you know, we would love to teach them. Also, just some people who are uh, have an anti-faith, right? They're, they have a, a predisposition towards not believing in anything spiritual or God. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, because we are celebrating and, and making a commemoration of what is widely known as the largest Christian holiday of the year, right? Easter. And my kids and I were sort of talking about this yesterday, debating whether it's Christmas or Easter. And, and you could debate that, that's fine. I mean, Jesus did have to come, so that is important that we have uh, the Christmas holiday, even though we celebrate that every day. And same with Easter. We celebrate Easter every day, but it's a good time and opportunity for us to highlight it. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to highlight it. But I think a lot of times, you know, obviously in the world, if somebody is uh, either ignorant or resistant to Jesus, they have a position. But also just, even in Christianity, I believe and will catch myself sometimes taking the really core tenets of our faith and allowing them to be diluted in my mind, to not allow them to have as, as much of a focus as they need to be. And so what I want to talk about today is how we can build faith in the event of the resurrection. We can build faith in the resurrection because without the resurrection, without that event taking place, then what we are doing here is, is really meaningless. Uh, we could be doing a lot of other things right now with our time. We could be involved in other clubs. We could call this something different and do the same thing and, and love each other and, and do the best we can. And just, but the resurrection is what distinguishes what we're doing from all of that. Just us trying to muster up the energy to do better. And, but sometimes I think in our faith, whether it's just the tenets of Scripture and other areas or this core principle... Sometimes we look at it in a lackluster way. We kind of look at it in a, in a, in a lazy way, in a forgetful way. We, we, we allow it to lose its luster of importance in our faith. And so what I want to talk about is this idea of building faith in the resurrection. And if I could, sort of resurrect the importance of the resurrection in our hearts. And really cause us to focus on what happened and what it is and why it's so important for us why this does set you apart if you have faith upon it. So I want to meet doubt with details. That's how we do it. In the Word of God, the Bible says that faith is built by Scripture. Right? And so the reason that you and I sometimes lack faith is, is really simple at times. Because we will. Even as a believer, sometimes you can stray from the faith. Sometimes you can lack in it. But we are called to walk fervently in it. Here's typically the reason why. It's not because you don't know the Bible stories. It's not because you haven't been taught the, the concepts. It's because you and I often don't know the actual Bible, the words of Scripture. We're ignorant of what the Bible actually says. Most of us, if you're taught in the public school system in particular, even private schools, most of us are taught from a very young age by men and women in schools who have never read the Bible to doubt the Bible, right? So, so that we are, we are taught with passion to reject what is in here by men and women who actually have never cracked it open because they are standing also on the shoulders of other men and women who are standing on the shoulders of other men and women who also have chosen to doubt. Or we're taught by men and women who have read it but choose, instead of faith, the position of anti-faith to disbelieve it. Listen, that's just a head fake. That's all it is. It's just a head fake, and I don't want you to be fooled. And so we're going to be talking about what it means to have faith in this monumental event known as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, back then, it was no different than it was today. right? I think sometimes we think, like, oh, if I just would have lived close to Jesus... 
I would have been one of the disciples, my life would be so much different. I would have had that proximity to see all the miracles. And, and even if it was just after that, and I got to see all the crowds and people. and Listen, it was no different in Jesus' day, even though he did raise from the dead. 2,000 years ago, the educated leaders of the day, the ruling class, the Sanhedrin would say this in Matthew chapter 22. I think we've got a slide. Matthew chapter 22. Look, this is the first mention in your Bible, which is usually pretty significant. This is kind of how you can lay out a, a, sometimes a given definition of how a word is going to be used in Scripture. The word resurrection deals with doubt. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him. And you'll see what they end up asking him is, is to tempt him. And so you see this concept they say. It's interesting. We don't know what they believe. But we do know that they say that there's no resurrection. And so you've got to get this down. If you're taking notes or if you just, you've just you got a photographic memory. or uh, Faithlessness is a deceit. It's a deceitful practice and it's not to be trusted. Just like the serpent in the garden, it does not deny that there is a God. Only the description of who he is. It does not deny God. Only his place in your life. It is no different after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Men and women, despite there being 500 contemporary witnesses recorded, still wanted to reject it. Acts chapter 17. Check this out. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So it's a choice. People want to choose whether to believe it or not. Now, notably it says that they said it doesn't, doesn't clue us in on what they believed in that passage. Mark also gives us the same insight in the Gospel of Mark. But I think that's important because the disciples, the apostles, also declared something. This has something to do with how the Bible reveals truth. But in Acts chapter 4.33, look at what it says here. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So they were preaching the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul's making the case, like, these are witnesses, eyewitnesses of what happened. These are men preaching, declaring God's truth. Why? How is it possible that you're doubting this? Why are we making this choice? And so, I didn't make this as, as part of our main points for this morning. It's, it's something, something worth writing, writing down if you're, you're taking notes. Or again, if you're, if you're rain man, take, take note of this. Words matter. Words matter in your life. Right? Somebody made a comment to me earlier. You know, because uh, we're sort of a diverse group. Praise the Lord. Jesus is a building a church for all peoples. And that's, and that's what we want to replicate. replicate right? We want to be able to do that all over the world. We don't want to be you know, the white, white church, church or the brown church or the green, green church. church. We, you know. And somebody else is speaking another, and you, you have to be vigilant and watchful to make sure you're communicating the right things because Confusion can, can seep in, and so words matter. We understand this. Words that you read, right? Some of you, some of you read certain journals, certain, not really papers anymore, but newspapers, and you'd never set your eyes on, a, on another one. You're fixed into this source of news. Some of you only hear from certain people, and you've made yourself available to a certain grouping of people that only believe a certain way and only teach and think a certain way. Words you read matter. Words you listen to. And you know what? Also words that you say, they matter. Like what comes out of our mouth, our mouth matters. And so here's a question for us to consider this morning as we get started. What words are you surrounding yourself with? What dialogue, what information are you taking from to influence your heart. Because this really has an effect on how you live. It affects our worldview and the decisions we make. And some of us, we only know a certain flavor 
because that's the only thing that we've, I'm not talking about languages here, I'm talking about, I hope you guys see what I'm saying. Sometimes we've only made ourselves available to certain information channels. And in this world, I'm telling you, this information channel here has, is typically being relegated to the dusty shelves of lore. Because the church hasn't done its job. The church has not done its job to present an opportunity to know it. And so the church itself is producing Christians who are shallow. And is a cha- shallow church going to reach the world? Probably not. We have to be different, church. We have to be a church who's willing to be uncomfortable, to open the door of opportunity to be able to share God's truth with people. Because I'm telling you, most people have never opened it themselves. Most people have never heard it. The only thing that they have heard are concepts of it, distorted depictions of it. But if you're giving yourself an opportunity to hear God's word, God's going to open your heart up. But if you're not, here's what will happen. When opportunities of faith will come about, it'll be like how I encountered yesterday. We, I encountered some people that were really interested and some people kind of indifferent and curious. And, but some people, just the idea, religion, no thanks. I don't even want to, and it, with anger, defiance, pushing back against it. And, you know, I even tried to, oh, man, me too, ma'am, me, me too, sir. I don't want religion either. But can I tell you the story of Jesus? I'm not trying to get money. I'm not trying to get you to join our group. But can I introduce you to Jesus Christ? He's not a religious man. He's, he's the son of God. And there's just, there's no interest. And not more than no interest, there's a, there's a, there's a struggle against the idea of God. Because the only thing that's been cultivated in most natural hearts is an idea to do it ourselves, to go against God. Check this out. I'm going to put a long passage up on the screen because Paul's building to something. Now, Paul was, um, Paul was a, an apostle. Paul writes the book of Romans kind of like a, a lawyer's brief. And he's building this, this idea, and he gets up to Romans chapter 10, and he's beginning to reveal how salvation works. And so he's, he's sort of building his, his case law and his facts. But check out what he says here, talking about the subject of calling upon the Lord. How then, you can read it along here, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's pretty logical, right? I mean, we could pretend, you know, oh, whatever in the sky, you know, and insert all the jokes that you want to there. But if I don't genuinely believe it, right? Paul's saying, like, how are people going to call on God the Father if they don't truly believe in him? Okay, so let's break. So how do we get there then? Well, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So it's a, it's a revealed or declared truth. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And so that's, he's basically, they're summarizing the job of the local church. That our duty is to use everything in our power to be able to convey the truth. People have to make their own decisions. But we've got to be bold. We've got to at least be able to present it to them. And how shall they preach, this is us, how are we empowered, except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Good things like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about why that's good in a minute. But, you've got to get this down. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, who hath believed our report? Okay, now flip the screen to the next one here, because I want you to see this. So then faith cometh by hearing. That, that means like an under, a heart understanding of the word of God. And hearing by the word of God. And so here's the, the formula. If you're a person who struggles with faith, okay, which is probably all of us to a degree, but, but you maybe are a person who is really challenged by the idea. That's okay. This, we all start somewhere. What Paul's saying is, if you want to grow your faith, you you got to expose yourself, not to the ideas of this, but you have to be actually exposed to what the Word of God says itself. You ought to open it up from time to time and read its words and let those words wash over your mind and your heart and, and allow it to challenge how you've been taught before. 
whether that's religiously or just from a secular standpoint. Allow it to change you and challenge you, and then, and then trust the Lord. Trust the Lord to have the wisdom to be obedient. You know what? Sometimes that's tough. Sometimes you're like the, the heathen man in the Gospels who, who, upon receiving a word from the Lord, Turn to Jesus, and he's like, I, I'm trying my best, but he's beating on his chest, and he's like, Lord, help me. Help mine unbelief. And so oftentimes, that's where we need to start. If you're a person of, of natural unbelief, which actually is everybody here, but if you're a person who's still there, and you're struggling, I'm not even sure I, I want to believe. I, I, I want to, but man, can I just invite you to open up the Word of God to, to be faithful to church, to come here so you can hear the actual words of God preached, not some political message of, you know, my favorite guy running this or November, you know, my favorite pet cause, how I think we're going to save everybody. Like, can you, can you just be faithful? Just show up. Just, just come to dinner. Be spiritually fed and learn what the, wor- the actual word of God says. And let that wash over you. And give yourself some time. Give yourself time to learn what Scripture says. And and just just watch. Watch and see what the Lord will do for you. Watch and see how He will change you from the inside out. Not because you're you're coming and, i got to please Pastor Mike. He wants me to do this and that. And I'm going to serve on this team and show up and do that. There's some elements of that that you need to do. But that's all because of the source element. The, the core information is, is this, that you're, you're being changed from the inside into a new person. You see, today, the resurrection is called into question. Not only by the world, but even by, by weak believers. The resurrection is called into question. And your faith and mine regarding this topic is most critical. But it's being challenged. And when it is successfully challenged, you got to hear this. When the faith, our faith in the resurrection is successfully challenged because our faith is weak, is weak or because we're ignorant of it to begin with, then here's what happens. The bedrock of our identity is also brought to bear. And it risks crumbling. And for a believer, that leads to you, Christian, not knowing what you are really to live for. You're living for the wrong things. We're trying to be both godly, because you're not going to deny Jesus, but you're just not sure how in you are. Because why would you be sure if you're not even sure if it happened? Maybe at one point in your life you did, but now you've been allowed to stray, and you've not been faithful just to get into the Word or gather with His people. And so, yeah, this is the natural result of that. And so I found myself here many, many years ago. This is my testimony. And I was a believer. I was even raised in the church. And so I had a cultivated heart in the sense of I knew God's word to some degree. Not not a lot of it, but I knew some. But I was trying my best to be godly on Sundays. And when I was with my church family, but then when I wasn't with them, man, I just wanted to be as as cool as I possibly could be and and be as worldly as I possibly could get away with. Uh, I was living two different lives. You know what happens when a believer tries to live two different lives? Most miserable are we. That's what happens. It is not set up for that. It's it's like when you become a Christian, your mainframe, okay, sorry guys, correct me if I'm using the wrong terminology, but but you've been been rewired, okay? The the program language is no longer C++. See, I'm going to start going down a road now. It's going to get me off track. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stop there. You guys know what I'm saying. You've been rewired now. Now, like the DOS C colon command, like you're functioning on a different system. And if you're still trying to run commands based upon the old ways, or if you're a believer, maybe raised in the church, and you're trying to to step out into ways that you've never even truly experienced, and uh, and live a double life, you're gonna be miserable. That's how our life as believers comes crumbling down around us. That's what so many pictures in Scripture, trying to be both godly and worldly. And you know what else? It's exhausting. 
It's like you're, just, you're running on two different treadmills. One that gives you peace, and the other which you think is just awesome, but really just wears you out. And you keep going back and forth, and God has a plan, and, and He wants to work in your life, but you're also wasting your time doing other things that don't matter. You see, it's impossible to serve two masters. That's what Jesus says. That life never works. And so let me give you just a couple points, and then we'll be done. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit simple this morning. Here's point number one, if you're taking notes. Having faith in the resurrection equips us to live light or live in light of its reality. Okay, now that it's sort of. I'm just going to read it again. I think it's just simple. Faith in the resurrection will equip you to live in light of its reality. Because there are some truths that come about if the, re- if the resurrection's real. If the resurrection is real, there are some things that you can count on. And I want you guys to know about these. Because having faith in it, that, that now sets us on a different path. On our, our 24-7, on our week-to-week, on our month, to, on our life, on the trajectory of what our plans are for ourselves. Having faith that the resurrection is real now causes us to set up a little bit straighter when it comes to wanting to be a part of God's plan for our life. And so let's talk about it. Now, we talked about where faith comes from, right? Anybody remember? Where does faith come from? From hearing the word of God. So we have to know it, right? We have to. Now that could be just ABC, Jesus loves me. Maybe you got maybe you got to open up John 3 and just just kind of hone in there for a little bit and just reread that story a few times. It's good. It's good bedtime reading, right? Going to bed at night, had a rough day. Just read John 3 over and over. Just read it. Man, that'll speak to you. This this religious guy that went to Jesus by night because he was kind of unsure and uh, but he had questions and Jesus was just was gracious. He loved him, even this proud religious ruler. And he, re- he was gracious to him and just said, hey, man, you, you, you need to be born again. You need, to, you need to have your life changed. Your whole identity needs to be changed. And so since faith comes from knowing and believing God's word, I want us to see what the word of God says about resurrection. We looked about Matthew chapter 22, the first time it was mentioned. What did we see? Doubt. And I think that's interesting because what do we see today? We see a lot of doubt in the world. We even see a lot of doubt, sadly, in the so-called church. Right? Remember the Sadducees, say, which say that there is no resurrection and ask him? Well, other than rhetoric where we're quoting some guys that didn't know anything because Jesus says that they erred not knowing the scriptures, what does the Bible say about it affirmatively or doctrinally? Well, you've got to know this. Now, we're not going to run through these because this is a lot. But um, 40 times it shows up in scripture, the word resurrection. 40 times. And 42, if you count some derivative words that are, that are kind of like it, and we're not going to go into all these 42, but I, I, I pick some clumps because sometimes Jesus or others kind of clear off some space and just talk about it for a while. And so we're going to look at some of these things. But here's what it means <clears throat> if you're going to define it. It means to rise up from the dead, mostly. Sometimes, in, in the roots where it comes from, means to rise up like from a seated position, or to have like a resurgence, which is a good definition of Jesus' life. He was like surging uh, in, into the world system and, and pushing against it. And so that's what resurrection means, okay? It's to rise from the dead. Notably, we believe, just like Romans chapter 10, if you go back a verse before that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, rose from the dead. And the Bible says if you believe that in your heart, that He is Lord, and as the Son of God, He rose from the dead in His own power to pay the price for your sins, which is an offense to God, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. This is awesome. This is the good news of the gospel. Confessing with your mouth who is Lord and confessing who you are in light of that and just believing that, man, God loved you and made a way for escape. Well, um, let me show you some quick things. Like I said, we're going we're gonna to go pretty quick this morning and then be, be finished. 
Point number two is this. There are two resurrections in the Bible. Two resurrections in the Bible. And uh, here's what I want you to see about this. John chapter 5 defines it. This is not something I learned in a school of theology. You can learn it this morning right here, just in the Bible, because it says there are two resurrections. John chapter 5 Look at what Jesus is saying. He's, rebu he's again rebuking these religious guys that don't know Scripture, just like today. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming into which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. All mankind... Did you see that? We'll experience one or the other. All. All that are in the graves. That is people who know Jesus. That is people who do not know Jesus. Every person will be resurrected. And so, whether you want to believe it or not, the scripture says that you're going to be affected by the resurrection. And the Bible says... Right? Jesus is making it clear that if your works don't line up, okay, and I'm going to explain this in a second, because in the New Testament, Paul and, and Jesus both, we, they define what this means. But if, you're not a, if you don't do good works, you're not going to make it for the first resurrection. And if your life's about bad works, then you're going to be part of the second resurrection. Now, here's the problem with that. The Bible says that none of us are good. No, not one, the Bible says. I'm preaching up here. I spent a lot of hours preparing this week for this message. Um, I spent time through the week praying for you guys. I'm not a perfect guy at all. But this is what I do, right? And uh, I, I try to shepherd the church. But I'm telling you, if it was up to my own good works, I wouldn't make it. And the guys that mentored and discipled me, they wouldn't make it based upon their own good works. And so what's Jesus saying? He's saying that, there, yeah, there's none good. And he later explains this is why he had to come, to pay the price, because there's none good. And what we do when we believe upon Jesus is we take upon ourselves his good work, the work of the cross, his ability to rise from the dead in his own power. You see, we can't work our way to heaven. It's impossible. But make no mistake, Jesus didn't make a mistake here. You're either going to exist to partake in the first resurrection, which, praise the Lord, we get to ride on his coattails, the coattails of the work of Jesus Christ. Or, if you want to be stuck in our own works, you're going to be part of that second resurrection, which is not what we want to be part of. All mankind will experience it. That's what, that's what Luke 14 says, too. Either resurrection with Jesus, the first resurrection, those that do good. I put that in quotes, not because it's bad doctrine, but because Paul explains later what that means for the New Testament after he rises from the dead. And then resurrection without Jesus, the second resurrection, those that do bad. So resurrection with Jesus, I want you to see that, what's going on here, because... There are some things that you and I get to derive because of Jesus' resurrection. Those that call upon Him, knowing that our works are not good in comparison to the Lord. Our holiness, according to the prophets, is like filthy rags in comparison to the righteousness of God Almighty. The reason is because we're tainted. We have, there's, it's, it's intermingled, right? We do good some days, we, we do horrible other days. We dishonor God, right? We're not purely 100% righteous like God is. And so in God's presence, we would not survive. We would be consumed by His righteousness. And so that's why the only, only hope we possibly have is with the righteous blood of His own Son. This was the only, the only substitute that would be sufficient is if we call upon Him. And the Bible says if we do that, check out what 1 Peter 1 says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, because, man, we didn't deserve this. What we deserved was judgment, because 
man, we, we rage against God. But because he withheld that and hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by how? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible says that because of the resurrection, you and I will live also. We're going to live also one day. This is, this is a great thing. Now, some of you guys are younger. I'm, I'm getting to that point in life where you roll out of bed and it's like, you know, ah, you know, creaking and where's the walker at? Not, not really. I'm not there. But uh, it's like I see it. You know. Over the, it's coming. And uh, some of you guys, you spring out of bed and no problems. And, you know, where's the gym? You know, it's like five in the morning. And, you know, where's the gym at? And, you know, you're doing two a days. And, uh, okay, so time catches us all, right? And the, the beauty is this, though. Uh, he gives us eternal life because he rose from the dead. He conquered death and he conquered our sin if we put our faith upon his work alone. This is the beauty of the resurrection. Look at what 1 Peter chapter 3 says. Also in 1 Peter, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, in context, what you'll see is, Peter's not saying that, hey, go get dunked, and that's, gonna, that's it. Whether you believe in your heart or not, go dunk yourself in some water by some guy who's spiritual, and, uh, and, and you're saved. That's not what Peter's saying. You have to read the broader context. The baptism he's talking about is baptism, Romans chapter 6. We'll get there in a second into Christ's resurrection. And in the same way that Jesus Christ died to himself and had power to raise from the dead, Peter's saying, here, look, here's the invitation. You can be buried in Christ's death. And just as he rose from the dead, we will be saved, the Bible says. Now save us, okay? You can skip over the parenthesis if you want. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're saved By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His good work. The only good work that mattered. His life. You see, we... You and I can't just show up and... You know, when we're babies, or or even an older age, just get dunked in in water that some guy said a few words over. Right? We... We can't do that and expect God's just going to let us in. Righteous, holy God, if we've never believed in our heart upon the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation alone. That's it. We have to trust upon His work alone. And so because of the resurrection, we can live. We can live just like Jesus Christ is. Also because of the resurrection, I have hope. I have life. I have purpose. John chapter 11 says this. Okay, now remember, I realize, okay, church, okay, this could be tedious, okay, but what I'm trying to do is give you guys the word of God because how does faith come? The word of God. So we want to know what the actual Bible says. I know you guys want to hear my opinions because I've got great opinions. But really, you really want to know what the Bible says about this topic so that way you can build faith upon it right and so what does the bible say jesus said unto her i jesus is the resurrection i'm the resurrection and the life okay now how does it come though how do we get life you see that colon okay the holy spirit preserved here proper english for you there's an explanatory phrase coming he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live not only dead in our sins, but also one day Jesus says, look, if you, don't, if you don't make it to the end and you die and are waiting in the grave, you're going to live again. Importantly, though, for us is that you and I get to live today. And so also because of the resurrection, we get to live today in Christ, that life, but I don't live for today. And that's my, our next sub point. Because of the resurrection, I don't live for today. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have references of this story of, of the apostles trying, or not the apostles, the Pharisees and Sadducees 
attempting to trick Jesus on this question of marriage. They, they brought in this lady who'd been married a bunch of times and had, didn't have kids and married by this guy. And, and they're trying to trick Jesus because that's, that's always their game. You ever meet a guy like that? Like, well, I'll believe in, in Christianity if, you, if I pray to God now and he makes me float. Okay. If God can make a rock bigger than he can move, then I'll believe in, in Christianity. Okay. Anyway, um, so they're trying to trick Jesus. They're going all these logical, you know, uh, hoops. They're trying to make him jump through. And he doesn't bite, just like you shouldn't bite, by the way, because that's coming from a heart that's already, it's already predisposed to not believe. But you can pray for those people, love those people. But God's got to get a hold of them, and they, need, they just need exposure here. And uh, so we can pray that. But Jesus didn't bite either. And, and uh, they're like, well, what happens in heaven? That was their question. Who's going to be her husband? And he answers it you know, very deftly. Of course, he's the son of God. And he says, look, you guys don't get it. You err not knowing the scriptures. You, you ought to memorize that line, by the way. You err, you do err not knowing the scriptures. And then he corrected them. He said, look, in, in heaven, my followers are going to be like the angels, equal to the angels. But even more, they're going to be made into be the sons of God like me. That's what he says pretty awesome like our, our position with the Lord one day that's going to be incredible and so here, here's what he's getting at he says look marriage is great that's, that's made for for man it's a picture of the relationship between God and his people but that's just for this life I'm presenting to you an opportunity to live for more than this life to live more than for your Roth IRA to live for more than your career and to live more than whether or not you have two and a half kids and, and a dog and a cat and the white picket fence and, and you marry the right person and, and you get to live in the right neighborhood and, and you're known by the right people and you're respected for what you've done. More than any of that, I'm offering you a greater purpose to live for eternity, for God, the way he designed it. And so because of the resurrection, because God sent his son who rose from the dead in his own power, who was just as much a man as I was, but perfect. Because he rose from the dead and because I get to partake in that because I believe upon his good work to save me, now I have a purpose. Now I can live for the same purpose he has. And this is amazing. I don't have to live just for the day. And because somebody upsets me or because something didn't work out, Right, I, I lose my job, or or I'm, I'm struggling financially, or or my boyfriend, not my boyfriend, you know, my girlfriend, or something like that, um, you know, stepped on my toes or whatever, um, you know. My wife doesn't do something I expect her to do, or I don't do something she expects from me. And my kids are acting up, or or whatever. Right, my joy, the purpose in my life isn't. Determine it now based upon the circumstances, the happenings that go on around me. And I don't have to be this roller coaster of emotion anymore. It, I could be in the most miserable, face in the mud, struggling to get out situation. But the Bible says because you're doing it and your target, the bullseye of your life is bent on bringing glory to God, now that's just incidental. Now that's pretty big to consider living like that. Especially if we lack belief in the resurrection. But if you believe in the resurrection, if you believe that God Almighty is so powerful that not only did He raise Jesus Christ, His Son, from the dead, but because of that same power, He plans to and intends to and will raise you from the dead in the power of His Son one day if you believe upon Him, that changes the whole trajectory and perspective of my life. What now can get me down? Uh, this didn't happen. I mean, in a hundred years, where no one will be alive in this room unless you break a world record, modern world record. In 200 years, in 500 years, okay, you and I are going to be wondering, wishing, desiring that we could have just 
had a better perspective on what our eternity would have been like so that we can give ourselves over to God's perspective. See, God's perspective is he's all about life. He's all about love, and he's all about raising people from the dead who put their faith in his way, and his way is Jesus. The fourth thing is, because of the resurrection of Jesus, I am now in Christ. Now, this is conditional. <clears throat> the reason I say it's conditional is not because this is the Baptistic way or the evangelical way or the Protestant, whatever okay, you want to call it, or, or maybe you've got a flavor you like. <clears throat> no, it's conditional because, again, we want to have faith in what the Bible says. And so Romans chapter 6 says it's conditional. That's what you see, the if phrase here. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, now we'll talk about that in a second, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. What this means is, we're not going to unpack this entirely, but you need to know this. If you have chosen to die to self, to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, to identify with his death, to repent, to, in other words, to die of your sin nature, to repent of your sin, to choose. I, I will no longer follow my sin. I'm going to be alive in Christ. If you've made that choice, calling upon the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says that you will also rise with him. This is huge. We will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Both present tense in this life, your life will be changed. But also, yes, in time to come. As we are planted in this ground, we will also raise again one day. Now, this is glorious. Most churches, this is where they live. And that's a huge thing. That's a big, big place to live. And if you only get one thing out of this morning, you ought to know that if you are dead in Jesus Christ, that you will also be alive in him one day. That one day you will also raise again from the grave. Amen? This is a great thing. And it's a promise of scripture we have. Most churches, when I grew up, when I was a young, young boy, most of the churches that I attended with my family, that's kind of where they lived. What do you mean by that? Is there more? Yes, there's more. I'll tell you why, how there's more. Because if you, if you notice, now this is a, a future tense, but... What he's talking to us about is future tense upon you and I if we are planted together in the likeness of his death. If when you and I decide in present tense to die to self in order to surrender to Jesus' life, your life in this life is also transformed. And now he gives you a confidence of a person who knows one day, not only am I living spiritually resurrected, but the reason that's powerful, because one day I know Jesus wins, and I'm part of his team. I'm part of that. I'm in Christ. And so when I, when I became a, a young man, man, just praise God, by the grace of God, my parents ended up moving uh, across the city 30 minutes to a different location, and, and we started going to a different church. And for the first time ever, I was hearing more than just what some sermon some guy wrote 600 miles away in some uh, headquarters of the, of the, no offense, Southern Baptist Convention. Okay, no offense to Southern Baptists. Okay. Uh, some guys ripping out sermons and, and sent, dispersing it to guys who aren't actually reading the Bible themselves, and, and they're regurgitating that the best way they can, sprinkling some of their own personal stories. For the first time in my life, I attended a church where men were opening up the Word of God in their own private time through the week and putting in hours of work so that they could teach me, not the concepts, not so that they could write their own sermonettes that were really cool and engaging, you know, but just contextually more appropriate. They did that, but they did it by showing me how to get into the Word of God myself. And, and they did... The same thing we're doing. They're looking at the scripture and they're encouraging one another. Why? So that you can live a resurrected life now. In other words, so that your life is not like it used to be before you were saved. So you can learn how to be that employee that you're supposed to be. You can learn how to suffer like Jesus did wrongly. You can learn how to be the employer you're supposed to be. You can learn how to be a 
the brother and sister in Christ that you're supposed to be to one another. You see, without this, you know what happens is a lot of people become believers and soon, soon right after, because they're not taught the Word of God for themselves, how to live their life, they're not taught to how to live a resurrected life, they become orphans of the faith. Hopping around from church to church, whatever just appeases their fancy in the moment. Oh, I like how that guy spoke. He was just so smooth. Or, man, what a funny guy. Or, or that lady, she's, man, I can tell she's investing in me. She loves me. I'm going to keep getting involved in, in whatever they're doing. And, and this guy, and the, oh, they've got smoke and mirrors and the rock program. And look, all that stuff could be great and, and great use, use tools by the Lord. But the thing that will change you is not any of those things. The, the things that will change you is whether or not you and I begin to actually see what God wrote to us. To open up the Scripture in the quietness of our own prayer closet. Right? Riding the tea into work. At home. Before we go to bed, as we wake up, over, whatever you do, whenever the Lord leads you to do it, but we're beginning to let God's Word change us. Learning to live a resurrected life now. You ever see that believer? Like, man, that's, that's a genuine Christian. I've known other people who claim Christianity. They go to this church, that church, but truly, they're no different than I am. You ever had that conversation in your head? Like, that's a Christian? Well, I guess I'm okay then. And then you meet somebody who's like really genuine. Like, and their life is different. Not, not because they're goody two-shoes and better than you, they still mess up. They still sin, but, but, but they have a relation. You can just tell they've got a relationship with God. It's not a religion to them. They're not putting on the cloak on Sundays only to, to shed it as soon as they get home to do what they want to do. It's, it's who they are. They're actually in relationship with Jesus Christ. You ever, you ever met the difference? I'll, I'll tell you what the difference is. Yes, they have to at one point have decided to have died to self, to be alive in Jesus. But if they've never learned to grow, okay, and, and they're just an orphan, then they're not going to be this way. But if they've learned to grow and they've been discipled in the faith, like Jesus took his 12, and they've, they've been able to open up the Word of God with somebody who's just walked a little bit further down the road with them to keep them accountable in those areas that, that they know that you're going to fail in because they've also done it, but they've learned to grow in faith. See, that's how you live the resurrected life now. And that's what this Easter I'm inviting everybody to do. Easter is about hope. I know there's a lot of hard stuff, and if we really, if you're predisposed to not want God, you you could hear some of my things and be like, oh, well, forget you. Like, I am okay. Well, I don't know. You probably are. You're probably better than me as, as far as being a human. Okay, but... But that's not going to get us anywhere if we're not doing it the Lord's way. Romans chapter 6 tells us that if we've been planted together in his death, we'll be alive in his righteousness because of his resurrection. Today, you and I are affirmed in everything we do. I mean, like my, maybe not my generation, but around my generation and thereafter, we were taught from kids because our parents and all the the books that they were being taught in colleges and high schools were telling them that this was the way to parent right that everyone gets a trophy and and everything goes no matter what you choose it's good man thank god that that's not how real life works otherwise we'd literally have just a world full of firemen and astronauts uh, and supermodels because that's that's the only thing everybody wants to do when they're a kid right and uh but man You see, that's what we're taught. Whatever we want, whatever our truth is, that's sufficient. But you know what? There's also a part of faith, and this is a harder concept, but, but I'm inviting you to consider that there's a part of faith that is a warning. There's a loving aspect of God's message that actually can be hard if you're not used to being not affirmed in everything that you do. And it's a warning. It's, it's a faith that offers a loving way to avoid great peril. It's a loving way that God, the Creator, is looking out onto His creation and saying, look, you're making wrong choices. 
And if you stay on that path, I'm telling you, that, that big bus that's coming down the highway of your life is going to run right over you. And I want to prevent that for you. I created you, and I'm trying to get your attention by, by and this happened to me in my life, I'm, I'm trying to get your attention because, yeah, that, that thing that you wanted to do, it's, it's not working out, is it? It's because I love you. I'm allowing you to fail right now because I'm trying to get your attention. God help us to recognize that. Because make no mistake, it is love that motivates the warning from God. He knows what's coming. And He knows that there is no way. Look, look when you and I get to heaven, no, but there's going to be no negotiating there. I don't care how smooth of a talker you are, what sort of CV you're building in this life. There, there, there's no question that your character and my character is unequal to the righteousness of God. And the Bible says that because He is so holy, that in His presence, not even a blemish is permitted. We wouldn't, we're not going to last in our natures. Here's the good news. Even though He intends and will judge sin one day, in love, He stands warning us and He stands inviting us that there's a way out because not all will resurrect well. Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6 lets us know that not all of us will resurrect well. In the first resurrection, if you're part of that, man, you are resurrected unto life impliedly, we're not going to go on to this, but there's a second death that you do not want to be a part of. And that's a death that the Bible says is required of all of those who chose to reject Jesus as the substitute for their sin, as the payment of their sin. You know why that is? You know, man, that's kind of harsh. I thought God was loving. and you know. you know why that is? Because while God is love, He's also light. And he demands that his character be upheld. And here's the, here's the truth of it. He, he's inviting you. He's inviting you to avoid the harshness of the judgment of sin by receiving the love of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, you and I, when we were born, the Bible says that we, we took on a nature that we inherited from our parents. Anybody here? have just 100% sinless parents. Perfect parents. Okay? Now, I love my parents. Okay? I, I thank God for them. And I'm not going to dishonor them, but, but they were sinners. And you know where they got that from? Because my grandmother and my grandfather, it's harder for me to imagine, but, but even they, they were sinners. And you know where they got it from? And you don't even have to be taught this. You know, these youngsters upstairs, they're a little bit older now, but you get the young ones. We've got some young ones in the church. You don't have to tell them to bonk their sister on the head if they've got the truck that they want. You know, they don't have to see mom and dad beating each other up to do that. It just happens. You don't have to tell a little kid to lie and fib uh, out of fear or because that's just who they are. Some people are more inclined to do that. It, it's in our nature. It's, it, we inherited it literally, genetically. We have a predisposition to sin. And because of our sin, mankind was on a war path with God. And that was a battle that you and I were doomed to lose. But Jesus stepped in to take the judgment for us on the cross. And His resurrection confirmed who He was. That he was who he said he was. His resurrection confirmed that he was a valid substitute. The only valid substitute. That his life was sufficient to pay for the appeasement of God's wrath forever. But you and I have to believe upon that. And that's the invitation. So this Sunday, because of the resurrection, man, there's really good news. This is great news. The gospel says that you and I can receive Jesus Christ, His work as the propitiation. It's a real fancy legal word that Paul uses. It means, it means like a substitute, a justified substitute, because He was the only one that really would work. Nobody else could have died because they were sinners. It, it wouldn't have been sufficient. 
only the perfect Lamb of God. So I'm going to ask real quick, and we're going to wrap up. Every head bowed, and uh, you don't have to do it, but I'm just asking you to do this out of respect for those around you. And um, maybe you want to disrespect those around you, but if you want to bow your head, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk to you, to your heart right now. And I want you just to think about my words, not in relation to the person next to you, Uh, You can close your eyes if you want. Nobody's looking around. But I just want to talk to you just as your pastor. Some of you, and you've never made the decision to believe upon Jesus Christ this morning. You believe he's historically there. You believe he did a few things, and maybe even you believe that he raised from the dead, but you've never taken that for yourself and believed upon Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if that's you, you need to do that. For the first time ever, you need to confess your sins. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. And I know that the only way to do that is by receiving his payment. I believe that he was sufficient to pay for my sins, and based upon his work upon the cross... I believe he rose again from the dead, proving who he was to pay for my sins. You need to do that this morning. And so the reason I ask every head to bow with your eyes closed, because I'm going to ask you just real quietly, if you've never done that, I want to pray for you. And if, if you're so bold, I would just invite you, just, you know, don't have to make a bunch of noise, but just raise your hand. And I'd love to pray for you if, you if you would like prayer over that decision. I've never done that. I've never put my faith in Jesus. I've been to church a long time. I've done this. Or maybe I've never been to church. I'm curious about it. If you want prayer about that, I'm not going to wait too long. Just raise your hand. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to call you by name. This is just between you and God. Anybody here knows I need a Savior. I don't know how to do it. But I heard you this morning. And, and man, can you pray for me about that, Pastor, please? All right, we've got a hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? This is too important to leave here. I know we've all got plans today. I remember being in my seat, and a decision similar to this was presented, and I just was begging for the pastor to shut up. Please, just can we get over this over with? I just want to be out of here. I'm telling you, there's nothing more important than this decision. This will plant you in Christ's death so that you can be alive in him as well. Lord, I pray, God, for the soul that raised their hand. Lord, I pray, God, that um, you would speak in their life. Lord, I I believe with all my heart there are others here that wanted to raise their hand. Lord, I know what that's like, too. And so, God, I'm begging you to speak to their heart. I can't save them. This church can't save them, but you can. And so I pray, Father, would you convict them that they need Jesus. Draw them to you like only you you can, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed if you would. So I pray, let me me say this, and and here's the invitation for you. And if if you needed to do that, you just weren't sure, didn't raise your hand, but you know, man, I need to do that. I need to be saved. Here's how you do it. Believe in your heart. You just confess between you and God that you're a sinner. And you confess that Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and bore your sins on the cross because you couldn't pay them yourself. And have faith today to believe that Jesus can save you. Declare with your mouth that he is Lord and risen from the dead. The Bible says that that faith is a faith that saves for eternity. And if you've you've prayed that prayer in your heart as I was just explaining that, good news is you're saved. You didn't have to do some crazy liturgy. didn't have to read a book or go through some class that I'd take you through. Literally, belief upon the Scripture in this manner is what saves you. Now, others of you, you've maybe already made that decision. I know some of you already have. you shared that with me in the past. But your faith has been weakened. And just like the resurrection, maybe you believe in the resurrection, but there are other parts of your life. I, I've, I've been lacking faith on to be a good spouse. I've been lacking faith in how to be a good employer. 
I've been lacking faith in how to be a good uh, son or daughter or mother or father. I don't know what it is. But you need to grow in your faith in those areas of your life. Here's the invitation that we commit individually and together as a body to grow in His Word. That you and I take it seriously. That we run every other piece of information through the holiness and and truth of God's Scripture so that we can live in this life a resurrected life. Not waiting, not trudging through this life in misery. Oh God, I can't wait for the resurrection because this life is horrible. Man, God wants you to have victory now. That doesn't mean everything's going to be easy. It doesn't mean things are going to be smooth, but you're going to have God's joy because you'll be doing it His way. And that's a resurrected life. Amen? Man, if, if that's you, a believer, and you need the prayer to turn over that leaf, man, can you just raise your hand? Can we commit to God to pray over this, to give our hearts to knowing God's Word so that I can live right now in this life resurrected, not waiting for the future, not putting it out. Man, can you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you too. Amen. Several hands up. Thank you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody else? Father, we thank you for your Word. Thank you for the hope of the resurrection. Lord, I pray for the brothers and sisters who raised their hand, those that need Jesus and those who know Him, who've allowed their faith to be weak just in life, God. Lord, you prescribed a path that is foolproof, but it it can't be done if we don't know it. And so, Lord, would you encourage us to know your word? Would you encourage us to be around others who will keep us accountable to learn it, to do it? God, would you help our church to have faith? We ask this in your power because there's nothing in our flesh that can do this right. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to move in us, even to do these good things. Please, God, do a work in us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to turn this off and just talk to you uh, privately.